Attention, please. Eastern Airlines Flight 19, now ready for departure. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the vacation kingdom of the world. There's enough land here to hold all of the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. We call it Epcot. Will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. Welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast. Taking you back to the vacation kingdom of the world. The way it was and the way it is in your memories. All right, welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast, the official podcast of the Lake Buena Vista Historical Society. This is episode 53, Cute Stories with Rolly, where we'll be talking a little bit about and letting you listen to the interview we did with Rolly Crump back in May 2019. I'm your host, Todd McCartney, and sitting with me as always tonight is Mr. Hal Bowers coming in from Tampa. How are you doing tonight, Hal? Aloha, doing just fine, thank you. Good to hear you again. I hadn't seen you in, well, we saw each other a few weeks ago, but hadn't heard from you in a while. We were all kind of uh, decompressing here, I think, after the big event. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yes. Also coming in from Ohio, Mr. JT Couser. How are you doing tonight, JT? I am great. Uh, here, the leaves are changing, raking them, mowing them, just getting ready for the upcoming winter season. The inevitable is coming. It's we coming. Got that stupid fall back thing this weekend too oh that's right yeah Ugh. let's just abolish fall, it once fall, and for all please fall. i can't decide if fall or spring is my least favorite season i hate fall just i don't autumn. mind fall it's it's it, yeah it's spring just is just mess. so wet here so it's rainy and leaves and nasty yeah and... i have a client yeah. in arizona they got it right they don't they don't fall back they just stay with the same time, at one time. oh yeah, it's one of the few places it doesn't yeah yep interesting so it makes scheduling interesting sure and f- coming from the east coast who does fall, uh, run his clock back mr brian p miles how are you doing tonight brian greetings and salutations from philadelphia where i happen to hate fall yes almost as much as i hate winter but i love spring because it's when everything comes to life and fall and winter are when everything dies there you go. and how, how so. you don't even have seasons they're very minor so I, we have seasons that's not true we have summer junior we have junior say, summer we have, midsummer we have value peak <laughs> and and uh i'm trying to remember what the other one is magic season yeah <laughs> that's true yeah those all, those are seasons all based on tickets so yeah well it's good to be back guys has everybody recovered from retro magic yeah i'd say so i am you know it was tired it, it felt like uh, as i told you guys as we left i go we need to do one of these trips where we actually see each other. Like I saw you guys, but I didn't see you guys. It was like, it was like we finished a, sla- uh, a Skype meeting about the event, and then I see you, and it was like it wasn't even like a hey, good to see you. It was like all right, what's next on the list? Let's keep going. And then you know after that it ended. It's like all right, have a good flight, and then we left, and that's it. Now we're back on Skype again. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I I had an odd casualty in a way with my I, I the shoes I wore. I had never worn for 12 straight hours before and I got back to the hotel and the tips of my toes had gone numb and to this day I got to go see the doctor the, the on the edge of my right and left foot both feet the tips really? are, are, are numb and not feeling well yeah were they brand new shoes no I had worn them before just never for that time period I must have your feet yeah grew. so if, you, if we have any podiatrists out there let me know what I should do you know? <laughs> contact I'm sure us we do. yeah I'm sure we do <laughs> let me know what to do because it's very odd I got a foot guy yeah, <laughs> send them over this way. What a casualty! Very, well, wow. Yeah, I know it sucked. So if we have to amputate your feet after this, I'm gonna be, feel really bad. Well, yeah. we're gonna really go for donations if that has to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna jump right into listener mail. Uh, JT, you've got the mail bag, and uh, what do we got in there from last? Uh, from, man, we haven't talked since what September be, since we know. recorded. So it's, it's been almost two months. It's been here. building. Uh, we have lots of of messages, and I'm gonna. I, as always, I save them. I drop them into a folder in the email that says Lister Mail. So I mean, if yours was sent in August, September, October, anytime. I mean, it, it's it's in there, and we still might get to it. So so hold on to hope, and you know, keep listening. 
Um, but first one I have here is Jason Burley. Jason said, hey guys, based on your recommendation and the number of times you guys reference it, I was able to obtain a copy of the Walt Disney's Epcot Center book. Uh, he actually got it for about 10 bucks, which is a good deal. He says it's fantastic. He wants to know, uh, is there a book we recommend that covers the Magic Kingdom in a similar way? And he's still working through the backlog of podcasts. Do you guys have any Magic Kingdom books? Uh, if you are kind of new into you know the fandom, then I could recommend uh, From When the World Began, which I think think was a jeff curdy book i'm trying to remember having done tons and tons of research prior it's like I, I was kind of disappointed in it because it didn't really bring to life anything that i didn't already know but if you're new to the hobby it is certainly a, a good a good that's starter why, one to get into why i've stopped reading beetle books because I've literally <laughs> I've, I've read the same stories a hundred times and i'm like somebody tell me if there's something new in one of these so the story of walt disney world comes to mind for me it's in the shape of the letter d uh you can get on ebay it's not super heavy on facts and stuff it has a lot of different uh older earlier photos uh there were a number of different editions uh basically from when Walt Disney World opened up to maybe into 75 76 somewhere in there but you can generally pick it up on eBay for uh you know 15 to 30 dollars depending on the condition so um another one too if, if you're into photos and want to see the same photos over and over again there are three souvenir books too uh walt disney world the first decade then they made another one just called walt disney world has a green uh, same size green uh cover on it and then walt disney world 20 magical years uh it's kind of neat to have the three of them and flip between the three books and see the changes over the years as well that's true it is cool you can kind of yeah see the same places multiple times it was kind of like the pictorial souvenirs the larger version of the pictorial souvenirs yeah. very nice I'd love to know how many copies of those those larger ones, they, like 20 magical years. How many of those did they run? They just yeah. seem to be everywhere. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Jason. Appreciate that. And uh, hopefully that uh, gets you, get you eBay in for some, some more books on the Magic Kingdom there. Next up, we have Matthew Driftmeyer. Matthew says, Hi, all. I have a question about spaceship names in the parks. In Mission Space, the spaceship is called the X-2. The spaceship in Space Mountain, as you ride up the main lift hill, the one with the famous Hidden Hench reference, is labeled the X-1. And if I'm not mistaken, the rocket in Flight to the Moon was even referred to as X-1. Are all of these rockets named in reference to each other as some sort of loosely connected backstory of spaceflight in the parks, or is Imagineering just not good at coming up with spaceship names? <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. And I know, uh, I think Hal's got uh, the definitive answer on that. Yeah, so the Space Mountain ship, uh, when that was built in uh, 1975, it actually had a big number 15 on the side. Uh, we, we've got some old slides and stuff that have that on there. And I think there were some other, like some of the other modules had some, <clears throat> some little numbers on it and it stayed that way for quite some time. And for some reason, I thought it actually changed to the FX one when FedEx took over, but I, I found photos today just to try to verify. And it, it looked like it stayed at 15. So I guess after federal express left, they went and changed it to the X one. So Knowing, I guess, what I know about how they do a lot of throwback references these days, perhaps it was a, a throwback to the old, uh, to the old spaceship name from uh, Flight to the Moon, but it, uh, it it did have a different name before. So, I wonder if it has anything to do with all the number of the, you know, all the experimental planes were always X and still are to this day. They're up to X sixty one. Yeah, uh, I mean, going in NASA and such. They're just. I assume you're just trying to make it sound cool <laughs> <laughs> somehow. So it's like, I mean, X one is one of those like it just sounds sort of spacey. I guess yep. if you have to throw something on there. Um, oh, and the reason it, uh, there was a fifteen on it is that that ship that was hanging down the middle uh, of Space Mountain there was supposed to be one of a series of sh mining ships and things that were in orbit. And when you were standing in line. And looking out of the star tunnels, there was actually like a number 14 that you saw, like doing some other explore, exploration in another place. So you actually, in the pre-show, you kind of saw how there was these series of ships uh, from a distance. And then when you were uh, riding the ride, you actually saw it close up. So I think it was supposed to be like being constructed in space dock there. Crazy. Okay. Well, that's good news there. Thanks, uh, Hal, for that. That's that's awesome. 
All right, next up we have a uh, message from Joe Barlow. This is a, a pretty good story. He says, uh, the last few weeks he's been listening to old episodes. He listened to episode 28, Whoop and Holler. That's the one we did about River Country. It might have it reminded him of a trick they used to play. So back in the 80s, they'd get in line for the inner tube ride, which was a mile long back then. So they'd uh, get behind a rock with a drink cup, make it into a megaphone. Said so then they make an announcement that said, uh, <laughs> "Attention, River Country guests! Due to inclement weather in the area, we need everyone to exit the water and seek shelter." Uh, <laughs> says they could get about half the people out of the line. If there happened to be some dark clouds, they'd get ninety percent of the line to leave. <laughs> it's a very clever trick, and uh, as we've heard from our uh, River Country lifeguard former cast members, they were pretty busy watching the water and not really chasing pranksters away. Um, but that, so that would make sense, Joe. And also, said, fast forward to current times, my kids have to try to Typhoon Lagoon. And unfortunately, uh, people just don't listen to an uh, authoritative voice like that. So, very good story, Joe. Uh, we appreciate that, and I can see it happening for sure at uh, River Country. Uh, next up, message from Kyle. He says, my question is, with all the resort hotels built since 1971... Is there any reason why they never went with the Asian or Persian resorts as originally planned and why they haven't developed those themes over the years? You know, because we went, you know, have Grand Floridian over there. We went, you know, why why didn't they go Asian or Persian ever? I think that by the time they got around to developing the next phase of hotels, when they built the Grand Floridian and Caribbean Beach and Dixie Landings and that kind of stuff that the theming was a little more whimsical. They had kind of transitioned away from trying to become a convention and adult uh, prime. You know, that was a big part of the thrust back then. If you remember when they opened in the seventies was trying to build two businesses, a family vacation business and this trying to become a convention Mecca for businesses around the country in time that, kind of moved to Las Vegas, which did develop those themes. It had several Asian themed hotels, the, the, um, what's the one Mandalay Bay and, uh, the, uh, Imperial palace was an Asian themed resort. Uh, but the big one there was the Venetian, uh, which, you know, on a Vegas scale gives you a good sense of some of what might've been in a Disney Venetian resort that was developed, around that time, late 80s, early 90s, would have been... I, I'm just imagining today how much Disney would charge you for the indoor gondola ride and the simulated <laughs> uh, blue skies 24 hours a day and what special guest experiences would be available, like dinner on the gondola for $7,000 or something. Like, who <laughs> who knows? It's The other thing I, I think maybe, too, is when we look at it, those, when you add up, and this is pre-Grand Floridian... If you look at Asian, Polynesian, you know, um, Mediterranean, all that, those are all destinations that were far away, right? Air travel was still becoming something in the late 60s when this was designed, something that you could do, and this was going to be a a way to experience. We've talked about how the Polynesian was really a getaway and designed to do that. And as Brian pointed out, they went more whimsical, and I think while you still had quote unquote destinations, i.e., you know, Port Orleans and Dixie Landings and Caribbean Beach and all that, they really got away from the far away destinations. Um, and they became more locally themed, if you will, or themed to a specific architecture, but maybe not really the destination and making it feel like you were there. Um, so I mean, some of that carried over, but um I think it's certainly, you know, long distance destinations really did didn't didn't become a thing. Um you know, after, after after the Polynesian. I think most of them are pretty local, if you think about it. And it became kind of passe in mm. the 80s and 90s. That I mean, it's it's a little bit back in vogue now, but 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 at that time, you know, with the Riviera Resort, obviously, um, you know, it's it's a little more back in vogue. But, but back then, it really was. It was like, oh, we're going to put you in the bayou, or we're going to put you on a Caribbean beach, or we're... Yeah going to put you in old Key West or, you know, and, and a lot of times they were able to tie in the, the the theming of the pools and the restaurants and all to either IPs that they could loosely tie to the, the environment, uh, which is a little harder to do. And, you know, Milan hadn't been made yet 
Uh, <laughs> so, so like it's a little harder to do with an Asian themed or a Mediterranean theme. It's kind of a very broad stroke. So I think it's all those things. Yeah, I'll <clears throat> I'll add. I think the designs of the original resorts were kind of hinging on U.S. Steel building them. So once they were out of the equation and 10 years had passed and no one wanted to do the chest of drawers style construction anymore, you basically have the opportunity to start with a blank slate. Um, They went to outside architecture firms for the Grand Floridian. I think it was an Orlando based firm. So they were probably open to looking at different things. And I I think as kind of Brian touched on, it was a different market, uh, you know, not only in, in who was visiting the resort, but, just like who, what are people looking for in resorts? Um, I think I think because the they were planning on building the Mediterranean where the Venetian was supposed to be, that they were still perhaps open to you know worldwide themes. But it would have been a much more modern kind of '90s take on it rather than like a very strict, uh, you know, oh it's like exact you know an exact re- reproduction of of you being there. Um, so it was, it was probably a combination of factors more than anything else. Cool, guys. Well, thanks for your take on that. Sticking with the uh, theme of going around the world, I have a what-if type question, or a a have you heard this story before from Matthew. He says he remembers reading some time ago that when Disney was stocking the shops for the World Showcase with goods from each country prior to the park's opening, the buyers were tasked with finding a specific rare item. It was nearly impossible for them to find, and when they finally found one, they put it on a shelf in the pavilion with an obscenely high price tag so it wouldn't sell, and they wouldn't have to go find another one. I know that's really vague, but I can't remember anything past those details. Uh, Matthew searched high and low. You guys heard anything about that ever? I think this is a good one to put out to our listeners and see if if they have anything like that. I mean, there were certainly some... uh some very high-end things I, I always remember growing up uh there was this silver taj mahal that started off in the magic kingdom and then eventually made its way over to the to the disney village there was uh, the arebus brothers like, crystal cinderella castle that's what is it oh, yeah. thirty thousand like or fifty thousand yeah, or yeah, something, something like, like that <clears throat> giant chess sets so they were all yeah i mean that was very part and parcel of of the the stuff that they used to do um back then something really impressive to catch your eye cool. well if you uh recall that or if you bought any of those items back in the day let us know we'd love to see <laughs> if you still have them and uh obviously if uh what they were okay so next up i don't know if you guys saw this going around the uh, the socials recently uh spaceship earth broke down and people were able to walk off it and uh, we had a couple listeners share some photos with us they snapped with the lights on and that sort of thing. And I just kind of wanted to uh, take a chance to say, well, we discussed that on episode 33.35. Uh, we did the D23 tour of the uh, ride. But people did see a couple different unique things that we did not see on our trip. Yeah, sound sounded like some more curtains were, Pe- yeah, were yeah. dissing or, or pulled away. They weren't, they weren't watched like we were on our tour. We, yeah, well, our so hands was, practically had to be in our pockets. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, we weren't allowed to take pictures or anything. But, but Don't even so, point. So where where we I mean just for the quick recap on the walk down on the part where you're backwards and kind of coming down your time machine vehicle rotates and you're coming down the the the, the length of the ride to end up at the end uh, on about I want to say the fourth or fifth floor um, the our guide had told us hey behind this curtain if you peek there was a little bit of an opening. You can see the cityscape from the 1994 AT&T version of the ride, which used to show the interconnectivity of the world of communications network all talking to each other. Uh, But basically everything from the 94 version that was taken out in the 2007 refurb, was it? 2000 something refurb when Siemens took over? Uh, I think it was 2007, uh, like was they don't take it out of the ride. It basically went into the storage floor there at the fourth fourth floor. So it was all behind that curtain. And one of the items that was clearly visible this time was this woman uh, from the 94, from one of the 94 scenes. Um, and there was a really good picture of her that went like wildfire on the socials this past weekend. I think the other thing that people came up to, they were talking about the, uh, there were some pictures that, that people took up, up at the top too, asking what the, 
what the bumpiness and of those cutouts were that was supposed to be the moon surface or a planet surface or something like that uh and uh, i think it's definitely a good listen to go back and listen to that episode because we talk about the entire walkthrough and also discuss how the uh attraction would have actually gone a little bit higher too and the the, yep. the the uh actual footings for the track are still there today they just just never completed yeah, that you were supposed to pop out that roof hatch like mickey and be able to see the whole park <laughs> and wave and... i did that in a photo op just recently at uh, the odyssey oh, yeah. on top of yeah, the epcot that. forever preview center right yeah yeah I, f- I felt like i needed a uh, rope up my pants to, to hold me on for the photo op you know huh mickey <laughs> yes well, that's going to close up the mailbag for now. Got quite a few in there, so thank you to all our listeners, fans, uh, for writing in. If you have a question, uh, want to know something, or just have an observation, podcast at retrowdw.com. Send us an email, uh, tweet at us, Facebook message, however you want to get in touch with us. We will add you to the list and potentially get you on a future episode. All right, well, it's time for this month's Audio Rewind, and... Uh... Did the three of you even remember what we did last month? <laughs> uh, country I Bears. What, I don't remember what last month's episode was about. What did we, what did we talk about last we month? Did, we did listener mail. Remember, we did a large Oh, right, 20 questions. 20 questions. 20 questions. Yeah. 20 questions. So, um, well, we did have a winner, and it is Marty Darling, and uh, he guessed the answer to this audio rewind. <laughs> All right, and it was from the Haunted Mansion. So Marty has won the uh, Vacation Kingdom poster and a DVD copy of Walt's Frozen Head, which I believe, uh, how was that? You donated that, correct? Yeah. Excellent. Well, actually, actually, the Walt's intern donated that. Oh, look at that. Is it? Direct? Yeah, direct from the source. Direct from there. So, so uh, Marty, will get that out to you as soon as possible. And uh, we do have a uh, prize for this month. A listener, uh, Joe Barlow, has donated some uh, commemorative tickets from the opening of Epcot. Does not have the original stub on there because you can't turn these in. But um, we got those to throw in, and I've got some additional uh, old ephemera and memorabilia we can send out as well. <clears throat> those prizes can be yours if you know the answer to this month's Audio Rewind. Nice. If you think you know the answer to this month's Audio Rewind, send your guesses to contest at retrowdw.com. All correct entries will be entered into a random drawing and determine the winner, and all entries must be in by December 5th, 2019. All right, guys, before we go on to our main topic, which is a little bit of rolly, um, we've talked about how we were at Retro Magic and what that was, and you know, we uh, certainly got a lot of people pumped for it and from our sur- exit survey, so to speak. Um good portion of those who attended are listeners of this podcast um so i know a lot of you were there we thank you for for coming it was a we had a really really great time uh i thought maybe we just spend a couple minutes and let people know who weren't able to make it how it went and uh so yeah we had a we had a really busy two days it led off with the uh with our vip fireworks event over at epcot at uh, italy isola and uh, we had invited all of our VIPs to come, and then we had a number of uh, ticket holders come in and enjoy. Um, we had what, what, Brian? We had the the brookies and macarons, and... Mickey Mickey brookies, which are brownies and cookies, yeah, mar- married together, which is those uh, were good. Uh, yeah, they were very That's good. What the name is. And we had, uh, I think it was mini inspired macarons, which were yeah. pretty good. And then the big hit of the night were the uh, the cupcakes. I know there was a Pluto themed one, and there were two others. Uh, I I forget the maybe Goofy was one of them. I believe Goofy was one. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, they were a big hit. I love that the Pluto ones had little candy bones on them. Like yes, <laughs> little candy <laughs> bones. Cool. But uh, we had a, a nice coffee bar and a, a full bar set up in there and. Uh, it was it was really it was what a great place to see Epcot forever the the fireworks yeah. show a great great venue uh, I will say the music on those speakers was a little loud it was a, we tried to do some intros and Brian had to use his uh, big boy outdoor voice well, he, you were able to belt over everybody so I think it gave me a throat infection <laughs> vocal so um, so that was a, a, a you know it was a, we were only there for about two hours but it was great to see Epcot forever which if you haven't seen I think it's uh you know does a good job in paying homage to a lot of the older songs and um, it's it's a short but it is what it is it's a transition 
uh, until we until we get the new show in uh, in a couple months. So, uh, but it's definitely an enjoyable night. But th- the next day was really the big day. We started out the day before over the contemporary, <laughs> setting up, doing audio checks. Um, yeah, it was a, that was going to be a half an hour like sound check or or check in visit. And I think we were there for about three and a half hours, just yeah, working, S- setting up tables and and putting everything on there. Um, you know, I th- I think before we go further and kind of describe the you know high level of the day. Uh, we just want our listeners to know that there, uh, there was a lot of people involved in this to, to pull it off and a lot of work that went into it, not only on the day, but prior to the day. Um, the reason that we're talking to you now and not last month of with another episode is, again, we, we spent so much time organizing and all of our VIPs put a lot of time into um, putting their presentations together and getting everything set for the day. So, yeah, the three hours that we spent there, it was, you know, we did virtual run throughs we were making sure that the audio system worked the projectors worked and everything was ready to go um and then i think we all arrived somewhere between 7 7 30 a.m so we were up at the crack of dawn uh, on sunday to to get going with the with the with the main event but it's we a bad a- idea just for the future it's a bad idea to have the bachelor party <laughs> the night before the wedding yeah <laughs> i was so thinking we that i was like dang yep. this is <laughs> I my my overall with everything you just said and if you were there and you saw everything happening and it, it worked well or it you know nothing was by accident everything was planned to a T even you know with the dry runs the you know beforehand the day before it was just you saw it all coming together and it and it worked out but man that the planning and detail it went into it was just insane to me yeah and we yeah. had about a dozen people who volunteered and helped us on Saturday in the setup and probably twice as many who helped us in the actual execution that day. And, you know, we've, we've thanked them all individually, but just a generic thank you to all of them for, for helping and yeah. everybody who attended. But the VIPs were great. I mean, the time they spent with the fans after the, before and after their presentations, uh, we didn't ask anybody to do that. We set a table up in the back, and if they wanted to make themselves available, they all did, uh, and they really enjoyed it. Uh, they really enjoyed the interactivity that they got with the fans. So I thought that was great. What uh, can I ask, Brian? What was your favorite part? The whole thing. I, that's really <laughs> hard. I, I mean, know. That's, I'm I, curious. I was reading. Everybody... I was reading survey answers where we asked everybody that question. It was funny because the highest scoring thing was Rolly Crump's surprise live appearance, uh-huh. uh, which was very cool. And one of the reasons it was very cool is, like, the whole room just got to project love. At, yeah. at Raleigh, who's who pretty much stays at home now. He's just, you yep. know ninety years old and and he doesn't get out and and uh, and about. He's he's got some mobility issues, uh, so it was just great to kind of like everybody just kind of hollering how much they love him. Magic Ron. Glow Cube salute to Ron Logan. Yeah, uh, that was a neat thing, which was really something we had only kind of <laughs> come up with the day before. Yeah, uh, it's like a and it was like a like it was a whim. Like we had them there, and I said, you know, we, would be really cool if we could pull this off. And Hal managed to pull it off before Ron left the stage, which was great. Ron Logan interrupting Ron Schneider to just yes to tell him, uh, you know, that his portrayal of the Dream Finder has more to do with people's love of the character uh, and continuing love of the character twenty years after he's left the parks. Uh, than than any kind of a static Imagineering take on it, which I just it was just lovely, and that was weird too because we were on stage and we couldn't really see because the lights and like you said it was like this voice just appeared like <laughs> yeah. Ron, like, just Give that man a mic. Was, yeah, you were like wait who is that yelling at us? Uh, yeah, because oh, we that's... we were in the middle of interviewing Ron Schneider about yeah. his work as the Dream Finder and other stuff, and 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 Ron was you know obviously giving credit to in. in to the characters of the dream finder and figment and not so much himself. And Ron Logan stood up from his table, Ron Logan, who did all of the entertainment shows at, at, at Walt Disney world. Uh, he kind of interrupted them and said, uh, and said, you know, I, I need to give Ron Schneider credit here. And so Todd quick ran and got him a microphone. And yeah, so after he gave his little his little spiel and everybody kind of clapped, uh, you know, I said it was like the voice of God coming in because we couldn't see anything. It was <laughs> yeah. just, it was just his voice coming out of nowhere. I think another one of the things is that when, when we had Jim Sarno up there and uh, our That's, friend this Scuba, is my favorite. Scuba Jim presented him with a model of Smart One and Jim had a tear in his eye and he definitely got choked up in the moment. And I think 
a lot of people captured that on their phones and it really was a special moment for him because um you know really a lot of people didn't know who created smart one and, until we kind of spoke with jim and uh, he was so happy to be there and so uh enthralled to to speak with the fans and so open uh, with open arms to talk with them which which was great um the other interesting thing too was i didn't even realize it until i interviewed lisa on stage is that the last time she was at disney world was in uh, 1982 when Epcot opened to be there for her grandfather to see the display at AT&T and here she is returning for the first time in her life um, just a week or so since that pavilion had actually officially closed to be demolished so a really interesting end to Walter Einzel's story there with her singing her his song the song from the from the attraction I, I mean my answer should be both musical performances because they were both like you could hear a pin drop in the room yeah. during the performance of two brothers and the performance of age of information. And the interesting thing was two brothers, everybody was expecting, like they knew what to expect. They, it's a song they love and it was powerfully, perfectly done by Allie and Tammy. It was just terrific. But the age of information is a song. A lot of the folks in the audience had almost no connection to unless they were, they were, you know, original first 12, 4, 13 year Communicore people, you know, that's a thing that they missed and they only know it as a historical thing. And Lisa put such a, like, it was, it occurred to me while mm-hmm. she's singing it, like her grandfather never ever could have imagined this. Like when yeah. he was doing that attraction and, and it's just, it was, it was moving and lovely. And I could not get the song out of my head for <laughs> at least a week. <laughs> I spoke Her to somebody this it. week who said the same thing that that's been stuck in their head for weeks. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I did ad lib in the whole thing was, and, and I, I, we got a big chuckle out is after Jeff Blythe, who is the, the three, uh, circle vision 360, uh, director went up there. I took my phone and and said I have to do a 360 degree photo with him, uh, and that the, you know everybody laughed at that. And he was he was great. He jumped from one side of the stage to the other so he could be in the shot twice. So yeah, he had the uh, wherewithal was... to know that too. Like yeah, I'll hop in over here too. You're like I guess he would know how a 360 <laughs> he would know how photo 360 works. works. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. Um, and also, you know, I, I, we, we discussed some things that we've been doing, um, and we talked about, and we also gave, um, gave away the, the gifts too, that were uh, the holiday ornament set. If you haven't seen them, um, we'll tell you at the end here where, where you can uh, get your own set. Cause we, we do have a limited supply that's left. Um, but that went over really well. And then Brian, um, you gave us a little his- history, uh, both in from presidential and history in the baking yeah, so history in the ballroom and history in the baking. Yeah, um, yeah, we covered uh, Richard Nixon's um, press conference from 1973 in the ballroom at the Contemporary of the Ballroom in the Americas, where we were, and uh, I showed everybody exactly where it was, and then we surprised everyone by bringing President Nixon himself in for a photo op. <laughs> um, I really wanted to hire a live Richard Nixon impersonator, but. Uh, 25 years after Richard Nixon's death, you'd be shocked how hard it is to find a Richard Nixon impersonator uh, to hire. So I had to go with a cardboard standee. But uh, that in itself was a whole uh, level of uh, like CIA level movement to try to get the box to Florida and then into the ballroom and then out of the ballroom so that I could bring it in. You can't walk around with a six foot piece of cardboard and it's not be very seen. hard to hide a full size standy. So, but we pulled it off thanks to art, some help from Art Miles, my brother from another mother, and yeah. uh, and it and it worked out perfectly. And there were, I think, there might have been more Richard Nixon photo ops that day posted on social media than there were with Bob <laughs> Gurr or Ron Schneider or anybody else. So. I hear he he made a monorail tour that uh, that that he, evening too. <laughs> Rich, Rich, President Nixon uh, made it to the corrugated wall and wow. took some pictures there. And uh, he had dinner with us in the Contempo Cafe <laughs> after the event. And uh, he is uh, retired to a nearby uh, home in sunny Florida uh, there in Kissimmee, where uh, he's going to live out his days, I think. That's so good. he That's is good enough. Uh, he's ongoing and maybe he'll make a return engagement someday. But as soon as I was finished that, we then uh, talked about Peggy, we had an interview with Peggy Ferris that we had recorded a few days before the event. 
Uh, she's an Imagineer for 50 years with Disney. Uh, wonderful interview. Um, we'll hear from her again, but she was on the team that developed the hand, which, and we found out after we played her interview, Tom Morris was part of that team as well. Yeah. Uh, that was on the fun foods fact finding mission, but then we all took a break for lunch and enjoyed our handwiches, which I have to say, while they weren't 100% accurate uh, to the 1987 version, they were good enough and they were very tasty. We, they were really, really good. Yeah, I had, they were really I tasty. I, I, I've been craving one. In fact, I got we got back and... and, and Todd's going to make his later. own handwiches. Here we go. I, well, no, I, I, I had this, I had this piece of bread, had, had this small hoagie roll and I cut it off and it's six thirty more six o'clock in the morning and making my son's breakfast. And, and, you know, it was only a couple days after I said, I got it. I got to do this for him. So I carved out the center of it, stuffed yeah. it with ham and cheese and mustard, sent it off to school and he, he was thrilled. So I didn't know what to do with the center. So he, he ate it when he got home. As a so so we, we, we did learn at the event from Christy, our event coordinator who used to make the handwiches that they, Back in the day when they used to, they had a, like a drill press that would pull the center of the roll out. Uh, yep. The centers of the roll <laughs> used to get bagged and sent back to the kitchen, presumably to make things like bread pudding and croutons and things like that. Yep. So Soup thickeners, whatnot. So yeah. Boy, what a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of interesting. The waste not whatnot. So it's all, a whole hand which ecos. Yes. <laughs> I, I really liked it. I liked the, uh, I forget which one I really, I had. God, I had the you started with and... the barbecue chicken. I know that. Yeah, that was good. I had that in the what tuna. What was the other flavors we tuna? had there? I had, bar- yeah. I had three of them. I had barbecue chicken, oh, nice. tuna, and the, uh, uh, ham I didn't and cheese? have ham and cheese. I had the other I one. had ham uh, and cheese. That oh, there was, was a beef. The steak, steak. steak and beef, beef and cheese, yeah. Beef and cheese, yeah. You stink. You smell like beef and cheese. You don't smell like Santa. Um, we also have the, uh, the, uh, the retro cookies were great. We had orange yeah, bird. I have two the, of them in my fridge. Yeah. I have, I have an orange bird and a five-legged goat in my fridge. Orange bird, five-legged goat, retro WD podcast, and the dragon from Electrical Water Pageant. So Disney was nice enough to allow us to recreate those, uh, or they recreated for us. Um, I got a couple brookies in the freezer, too. So if you ever want oh, nice. some. Nice. Well, well, next yeah. time I'm in New Hampshire, I'll let you know. Yeah, stop by. We'll keep, <laughs> I'll keep for a while. <laughs> got some cookies, too. Hey, you took a brookie all the way home. Oh, I had a whole bag of stuff. Are you kidding me? We, we, He's been eating them for two weeks. So this is this is funny. We had a lot of the extra cookies with us, and um, we're going through security. And we have pre-check, but my son had just turned 13, so he didn't have pre-check. So we had to go through the regular security line. My, my wife is carrying the bag and um, with all the cookies and security says, do you have any food in there, ma'am? My wife says, yeah. She's like, well, can you take it out, please? Because, well, there's like 30 cookies in here. What do, what do you want me to do? She's like, the whole bag is cookies. <laughs> so they allowed her to put the whole bag through rather than. <laughs> Who put cookies in his mouth? <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so. They did let us take it on. So we they, they say take your cookies. shoes off and remove your cookies. <laughs> remove from your, your cookies bag. from your bag <laughs> and your laptop. Uh, sir, they're brookies. They're not they're, cookies. They're not cookies. They're brookies. <laughs> so you didn't have the uh, the funny. dog security there. <laughs> yeah, they would have eaten. There. That would have really eaten. exactly. So I was gonna say that the whole event. I, exactly. I can't thank everybody enough for for attending, um, supporting us, uh, all of our volunteers. Our VIPs, they did a fabulous job putting everything together. Um, it was a, a wonderful event. It was exhausting. Um, you know, we are certainly looking at, and we have announced Retro Magic 2021, which will be a hopefully a similar sized event. We put out a exit survey, and a lot of you who attended replied back with some excellent ideas. Um, you know pointers and different things that we can do differently we, in the we promise you we'll have all day coffee next time yes yes we'll bring all day coffee that was that was that was a miss that was a major that was a major like hey man you need a coffee yeah. bar or something yeah, yeah i had to go to contemporary grounds to get mine I mean, <laughs> contemporary grounds had its biggest day ever that's right that from day. retro magic <laughs> so we definitely learned and, some and our gift the next time should be jackets <laughs> yeah we, and well, we are passing that off to there was there were some some comments regarding um the, the, the temperature of the room and, and screen size and all that and um and we, we'll be we, selling sweatshirts at the back of the exactly room yeah, it'll yeah. be even colder uh, so but yeah we, we we're taking the comments seriously and and on some of them we had to work within a very very uh strict budget um well, at the end of the day when we came home we had about you know a couple hundred bucks to our pocket and we had a few things left to pay and i can say that right now we about broke even, and as we mentioned at the at the um, at the event too, is that we all come down on our own dime, right? This is our 
Choi, we pay for our hotels. The society As I say, does not we, pay for that. we put the non in nonprofit. That's right. <laughs> so there absolutely is no profit to, to this event. Um, we all spent our own money to come down and enjoy it. Our families, you know, donated their time and their money to, to come enjoy it with us. Uh, but it does take a lot. The cost to fly everybody in, put them in up, up in hotels, um, feed people, get the volunteers, the gifts, the audio visual. Yeah. That was that was three weeks in the make. Four weeks we worked on just the AV alone. Um, and adding another screen, like many of you said, that's that's a it's amazing what a significant cost that was. Um, you know, the AV cost alone just to put that one screen up was was astounding. So th- thank you, everybody, the hundreds of you that came and supported the event and yeah. encouraged us to do the next one. We will do it uh, and it's going to be even better. So right. and I was I was excited to meet some people I'd never met before. And then I also when I got home, I had like random messages from people that you did say like, oh, looking forward to saying hi to you. you just just didn't happen. So hopefully yeah. we can catch you next time. I got three or four business cards in my suit pocket. I got to go grab. They're hanging upstairs. I remember putting them in and I never took them out. <laughs> so as people had given me their contact. You got to add them to your Amway list. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yes, we will see you at Retro Magic 2021, um, a 50th celebration. You already have the date. There's no That's reason right. to block. That's anniversary weekend for the parks. We'll be there. Uh, that'll be the weekend of September 30th, October 1st, 2nd. So mark, get put in for the day off now if you're really low on the totem pole. It's two years away. That's right. And we might even have something for next fall planned, not to the level of Retro Magic, but we certainly have some ideas. Uh, for a small event coming up uh, in fall 2020. But stay tuned into the spring for that. All right, gentlemen, with that, I think it's time to move on to our main topic, which is actually a segment from Retro Magic that we've decided to release as an audio and then eventually will release as a video. Um, But as we mentioned, and as you will hear back in May uh, 2019, uh, how Brian and I ventured out to California to visit with Rolly Crump. And you've heard us mention this before. And we've been sitting on about two hours of multi-camera and audio footage and audio. Um, and we finally needed to piece it all together for the event. So what we've decided to do here for this episode is a lot of you weren't there and may not get to see this you know, immediately. Uh, we wanted to release at least the audio portion of Retro Magic of Rolly's Cute Stories. Uh, so that you can hear us talking about the clips and let you hear his responses. Yeah, I mean, it's it's about 25 percent of a of our conversation with Roly that day. We covered a lot of stuff that that hasn't you know, you'll hear later in future years uh, as we as it becomes pertinent to shows that we do. But uh, this was the stuff we shared with the folks who attended the event. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a fascinating half an hour. Uh, some of the best stuff in there. Raleigh's a little salty at times uh, with his with his language, so uh, we'll we'll put that warning out there. If you're listening with sensitive toddlers, uh, maybe uh, skip this section while they're listening. But uh, it's nothing. It's nothing uh, that that most of you who've lived a few years uh, haven't heard before. But uh, just terrific stuff in here. So with that, um, let's turn it over to Raleigh and some of his cute stories. So we have a a video interview. Uh, many of you may know that uh, back in May, uh, myself, Brian, and Hal uh, took a journey out to the West Coast uh, after communicating with Rolly Crump and his wife. And uh, they were gracious enough to invite us into their home. When we sat there in Rolly's living room and reminded him that we had sent, we were doing this event and we had sent him a letter introduce, uh, inviting him to come and be our, our, our keynote speaker, he laughed and he said, <laughs> nice try. Because <laughs> he doesn't travel anymore. Yeah. So graciously invite us into their home. And uh, we sat there for two and a half hours or so. So we asked him a whole host of questions. And we, we grabbed over two hours of video and audio footage. And it was amazing. And um, uh, after we say goodbye, uh, Maurice, his wife, set out a fantastic spread of food. We sat down on his lanai porch area they, and, they were wraps so it was a one-handed sandwich yeah it was. I mean, it's true. all on brand here <laughs> uh so what we're going to go through here obviously we can't play all two hours but what we selected is a number of different stories that we think you will find interesting uh there's some new things in here we had never heard before 
historically where certain things came from that he walked uh, that he worked on. So how has a, a whole selection of cards here? You're not going to mix up and brand. No, we're not. We have, a, we have an order to so our AV crew. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce uh, the topics, uh, talk a little bit about them, and then let Roly speak for himself. Yeah. So so, so first up. Uh, one of my favorite attractions, and possibly one of yours here at Walt Disney World, was Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Um, yeah. Um, it was an opening day attraction, beloved by the fans, as I could just tell from their reaction. Um, it had a very unique two-track system, uh, which Rolly will speak about. Uh, and, and one thing that we found out was originally Rolly was in charge of all the Fantasyland rides. So uh, when uh, Dirk, Dick Irvine came to him and said, like, hey, we want you to be in charge of Fantasyland Dark Rides. So uh, he worked on that personally. And uh, we're going to roll the video now where he talks about how he got involved. Oh, yeah. Well, that was my favorite ride when I, well, that was so Dick Nunes' idea. Did you a little story about Dick and I? Yes, and that. <laughs> Dick said, when we were getting ready to do dark rides for Florida, Dick came to me and he said, are you going to do toad ride? And I said, yes. And he said, well, you're going to have to do uh, two toad rides, he said, because <clears throat> that's the most popular dark ride in Disneyland. And so I said, well, I can't do just do two identical ones. So that's when I merged the two of them together. So the cars would come in, you'd go, one car would go to the right, the other car would go to the left. And then they would meet in town square, and then they would go this way and that way. And I thought it was kind of fun because I thought if families went on the ride, and somebody said, do you remember the chickens in the chicken coop? No, I don't remember any chickens in the chicken coop. <laughs> because the family would see different scenes from the different parts of the ride. And I thought that was kind of fun. So I enjoyed doing that. And I was really sad. I don't know why they took it out. I mean, they needed space for something, so why not pick on the toad ride? Because it's the right size that they wanted, or the right square footage, or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> when I did that ride, I want to make sure that the characters look like the characters from animation. So I got an animator. I hired him to come in and do all the characters, because I knew that I couldn't do a job as good as the animator that actually did those. So I always called upon people that <clears throat> did, would do better. Okay. And that was the thing that Walt once said. He said he always wants to hire somebody that was better than he was. So I thought, yeah, that's right. So I'd always, if there was something that had to be, I didn't try to trace him. No, I brought him in. So that was great. Yeah. Well, I actually designed the ride and built a model on it. So, you know, everything that we did was because Walt always wanted to see models because he wanted to see the three dimensions. So I actually designed a whole ride, you know, and did a, 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 a model on it. And I, everything I ever did was a model. And then they showed it to Walt, and Walt loved that. That was, a, that was kind of a given. You know, you didn't, you didn't show Walt sketches all the time because, you know, he, he, he wasn't too happy about that. I always thought I was driving on Toad. I don't know why. As a kid, I thought I was actually controlling the ride. It, it was crushed when I realized I wasn't driving the car. Um, another thing that he worked on that, that we did not realize was uh, he actually did the interior design for the House of Magic magic shop that was on Main Street USA. So that was a, a huge surprise to us. That was a, an opening day store on Main Street. In 1995, uh, they actually gutted it and it became the Hall of Champions store as there was like that big Main Street redo and they redid the Emporium. Uh, and then in 2007, for reasons that I don't know if any, somebody in this room might know it, but it's not us, the facade mysteriously reappeared on Main Street and it says House of Magic again, although there's not magic stuff in there. So I don't know if that's... You don't think merchandise is magic? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the money is magic. The magic is in the money, yeah. Um, uh, so when we spoke to him, we were, we were surprised to discover his work uh, on that, and, and he actually told us a little bit about that. Because it was my hobby. Oh. And uh, I know that I, I started the uh, hobby of magic when I was eight or nine years old. And so magic carried through with me, and, and I used magicians on some of the designs I did for the Berry Tales to actually design illusions in there. And uh, I never had a chance to do that for Disney, but on the outside, I could bring in people and to do that. But I always loved the magic, and so when uh, there was a magic shop in um, Hollywood, and uh, I loved the way it was set up, and as a way, because I had to go over there on Saturdays and look at all the tricks I wanted to buy. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to duplicate that magic shop in Disney World. And so that was the direction I took. Nice. And you know, the interesting thing about it was I did a detailed model on the magic shop. 
and I actually hand painted it myself, all the squares and the floor and everything. And so when it came time for the people to build it, they said, well, where are your drawings? And I gave them the model. <laughs> and they, they couldn't believe that, that I would actually designed it to scale in a model form. And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> but that was just, you know, those are the things that you do as you learn. And it, it made things so much easier. And, every, and when you hand that model to somebody, say, oh, that's what you want. Yeah, it's up there. House of Magic. Uh, one of the other attractions we talked to him about that Rolly was part of was the, uh, the super group that put together the 1964 World's Fair attraction. It's a small world, uh, which is so beloved it went into every castle park in the 20th century. Uh, the super group was, of course, Mark Davis and Rolly and Claude Coates and Alice Davis and Blaine Gibson and probably a dozen other people that had a hand in things that were part of it. Uh, Rolly's most famous for the Tower of the Four Winds that stood outside uh, the entrance at the World's Fair Pavilion, or at the Small World Pavilion, which was sponsored by Pepsi at the 64 World's Fair in Flushing Meadows. Uh, but early in the conversation, this was very early in the interview, he tells us about this term that will now re-enter the Diz lexicon, I guess, uh, because I hadn't heard it talked about before. Uh, and we all were like, wow, that's a cool thing to find out 10 minutes into this interview. So here's, here's Rolly on It's a Small World. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I was involved with Small World wherever it went. <laughs> <laughs> I had to make sure it was all right. Now that, yeah. Uh, I, I think the biggest uh, problem I had was, especially Disney World, they didn't stage it properly. Mm -hmm. You know, Disneyland, my God, we had the 300 feet across the front or whatever. And when they, uh, when they did Disney World, <laughs> they, there was a little area called Irvine Alley. And that was Dick Irvine had made this little tiny place to walk. And oh, by the way, we'll put Small World there. Oh. And so we were forced to put Small World in a very tiny area, and, uh, which was quite disturbing. And because after you got used to the one at Disneyland, you know, the one at Disney World was kind of sad. But the good thing about Disney World was I got to put water to the sets. Yeah. And that did not happen at Disneyland, you know, because in those days we hadn't done anything in that area, in that direction. And Walt never thought of it, neither did I. But uh, yeah, so that was one of the happy accidents That's that we did. There is a little story behind the balloons. I took Walt through there on a walkthrough once, and we were one little area, and it was in that particular area, and he says, well, he says, you know, you've got a space up there. He said, uh, he had a title for it. It's a, a film title, and I forget what it was. Holiday. He said, you got a holiday up there. And I said, I do? And he says, yeah. And he said, I said, what the hell's a holiday? Because he knew, because yeah, it was all uh, film talk. What it meant was it was an empty space. So he explained to me what they thought. So he says, oh, hell, we can take care of that. I'll just put some balloons up there. So I said, okay. And that's how the balloons got there. Oh, nice. Uh, I, I don't know. I, it's hard to remember all the different yeah. little things about Small World. I, all I knew was I was always in love with it, and I was in love with Mary, and I was so faithful to her, faithful as that could be, because, you know, what happened was we were getting ready to do the, the uh, ride, and Walt wanted to do a children's ride, and so he brought, we were in a meeting one time, just the three of us, and he said, I want a children's ride about around the world. And I told Dick Irvine that. So Dick Irvine said, okay. So Dick got, uh, I said, I'll have Mark Davis do an uh, illustration of what the interior of small world would look like. So he did a beautiful rendering. And he brought it in the next week and he showed it to Walt. And took, Walt took one look at it. He said, what's Mary Blair doing? <laughs> it, because Mark didn't have that little charm that Mary had. And so uh, Walt asked uh, Irvine to call Mary and find if she'd be interested. So they called her on the phone and asked her if she'd like to work on this little ride and everything. So she said yes. And um, what she did do was uh, uh, a whole series of sketches of children around the world in her style. And that basically is what designed Small World, which is great. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So how we got that story about the balloons was Hal showed him a picture of the clown and the balloon holding the help sign that has since been taken out of the ride and said, what's the story behind this? And as happened frequently when we showed him pictures of stuff and both that and Mr. Toad, he said, I didn't do that. That must have been added after me. 
Yeah, so we actually have to take a, take a deep dive with him to see what part of Toad that, uh, that we're familiar with before it got changed was actually his and what may have come in through a rehab in the 80s. So uh, TBD, we'll be, we're, yeah, we are working on that now. Yeah. So we're going to move over to Epcot Center, uh, where Raleigh had a hand not only in the original uh, uh, pavilions, uh, but some stuff that went on later. But his most famous contribution to the original Epcot Center uh, is the Land Pavilion, uh, much of which has survived the way that he designed it. Uh, and they were working on a greenhouse concept tour. He was working with Carl Hodges, who was the head of environmental research at the University of Arizona. And boy, he waxes poetic about Carl Hodges. I don't know if that's in there or not, but uh, they're both very old men still alive. And uh, in 1992, Carl created the Biosphere 2 project to see if people could live in a self-contained ecosystem. So that's a little bit of background on Carl, who he refers to in this video here on the land. Carl Hodges is probably one of my most favorite people I ever worked with. I think that was the thing about, you know, when you were in charge of pavilions and stuff, you get the right people in the right team. And they, I, I, they, they had, somebody found Carl Hodges and said, well, there's this guy we want you to go see, really. <clears throat> he lives in Phoenix. And so I said, okay, fine. So I went to his office and his whole office was a rainstorm going on. He had designed storm inside of a building and it went 24 hours a day. And I said, Jesus Christ, Carl. I said, what's this all about? Well, he, was, he was, had a lot to do with the saving water and using it correctly. So uh, he and I got together. And so he came up with the idea of being able to grow uh, of, of plants in, in, the, uh, in space. So we, in the land pavilion that we did, he was a key guy for the land pavilion. So we had all these vegetables growing on, and then the, on a little tractor, and then it would go through a car wash, and that's how they would be fed. So they were fed by car washes. So those goddamn things would run 24 hours a day, and of course it was underneath a, a sunlit roof. So they got sunshine during the day, and they got their, their little alk I mean their drinks during the night. And Hench just had a fit because they were, we were growing things in, in a building and trees. And he had also trees uh, that were growing in one, uh, one foot of sand because of uh, the ingredients that he put in there. And Hench had a fit because he thought we'd have to use fake plants because they were in a building. I said, no, John. I said, he, know why, he knows what he's doing. So he and I became real close friends. And he, what he did was one time he took the roof off his house in Phoenix. He and his wife had, you went into the house, you walked through the door, and there was no roof. And I said, what are you doing? It rains. He said, well, we get in the jacuzzi. And I said, you do? And that was another thing that happened was he and his wife said, well, we got to go into the jacuzzi now. And, and this was after dinner. And I said, we do? And I said, yeah. I said, I didn't bring your, my trunks. And they said, you're not wearing anything, Roland. So the three of us got into this jacuzzi naked. And I'm sitting there like, Oh, well, I'm sure glad he brought his wife along. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things. But Carl was like that. He had the great, and, the, and, the, and the, he had the cool towers, which was a tower right through the center of his building, and the air would come out the bottom of it about 20 degrees cooler than what was on the outside because that had to do with the way he laid out the, the roof. So Carl was a delight to work with, and he, and he really helped us because that helped the ride immensely to be able to go through there and see there and see radishes going by in space. So he was, he was a key to the land pavilion as far as I was concerned. For some reason, we decided to do balloons. You know, all this stuff kind of happened by accident. But, um, no, because, you know, it was the only way that we were going to fill that, that space, that, you know, the holiday. So I looked at that and I thought, yeah, it's a holiday. There's a big open space there. So we'll, so we'll put the balloons in there. And then the balloons, in turn, will the, the uh, illustrations on the balloons would relate to the pavilion. And so we did that, and it filled the space beautifully. They were attractive, and I had a little Chinese girl design the, the patterns on it, and it was just beautiful. So we were real happy with the balloons. And I know that years later, I think they took them down and repainted them a little bit, but I don't know what it was and they, they did. And they don't go up and down anymore. Yeah, that's right, they used to go up and down, right? Yeah. Well, as you can tell, Rolly didn't hold back with us. <laughs> we, we had a couple other clips we had to edit out. Um, before I mention the topic of, of this next, next one here, I, I think you guys are going to be able to get it with a couple clues. So this was made as a holding area for an original Epcot film 
uh, that later held an environmental fable. It's still there today. Uh, it was created by Rolly as well as a graphic and ex exhibit designer, Dolores Shelbourne. Uh, so we, what, what did we ask Rolly about? Everybody? Wall, wall carpet. carpet. We got it. So here's Rolly on wall carpet. It's wall carpet. <laughs> uh, she was an incredible stylist. And uh, in the lamp pavilion, she, uh, she, there was a waiting room before he went into the, to see the film. And so I told her to, to do an a abstract mural but do it in carpet. And so we carpeted the walls and the ceiling in that holding area. You know what gave me the idea for the carpet was I was back east on one of our trips and uh, I went to a restaurant, I forget where it was, and all the walls and ceilings had been carpeted. And in there, it was as quiet as a tomb. And you're in a restaurant, and normally restaurants are a nightmare. So I thought to myself, someday, I'm going to carpet the walls and the ceiling. And so we got a chance to do that, and, and Doris did it for me, which was great. There you go. And today, she is a senior executive for uh, Shanghai Disney. So she's had an incredible career from graphic designer to like this incredibly power, powerful executive. So From carpet to park. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We also are staying in Epcot here. Um, we asked Rolly about another area that uh, he had something to do with during... Uh, some uh, rehabilitation of the Epcot area. Uh, they brought him back in 1992 to work on innovations. Uh, we also found out that uh, the splash pad that is still there today and hopefully will survive, we don't know, that was actually his design. We had this, there was this book on this coffee table and it said Epcot Fountain and I nearly died. I'm like, is this the prison fountain, right? You know, I had no idea. And I opened it up and I was excited and disappointed at the same time. I'm like, well, at least we know where the splash pad came from. <laughs> yeah, so. so the splash pad's on that bridge between uh, Future World and World Showcase and he says, yeah, funny story about that. He said, uh, Imagineering had some guy in there, wanted to charge them some ridiculous amount of money. And I said to Michael Eisner, I can do that for about 20% of that. And he said, oh, really? He says, yeah. He says, you got the job. And that's how the fountains got there from Rolly Crump. Exactly. So we did ask him about another area uh, where it is still there today, uh, the electric umbrella. We, had, we were redoing uh, a restaurant at, at, what, at, at Epcot, and they didn't know what to do. And it just so happened that afternoon uh, when we were going to get to do it, we we'll get started with it. Uh, they brought an umbrella salesman in because they were getting some new umbrellas for out, outside, out front of it, and everything. And so he was in there, and he says, "Oh, the way he says I've got an electric umbrella." I says, "You do?" Uh, I see. He says, "Yeah." And he actually, had, they, this company had built electric umbrellas with lights. And you could buy them; you didn't have to add them. They were there. So I thought, shit, that's great. So I said, okay, fine. And so I said, we're going to put those electric umbrellas in the restaurant, and then at nighttime, take the lights down in the restaurant. I mean, in, I mean, put the lights back up in the restaurant during the day, and then turn on the electric umbrellas. Everybody got a big kick out of that. They just thought that was great. So I said, well, we'll call it the electric umbrella. <laughs> so that was it. Those are happy accidents again. He actually told us that Michael Eisner loved the idea so much, he actually wanted to call Innoventions Electric Umbrella, the entire thing. And they had to talk him down from doing that and go with Innoventions. He's an excitable guy. Yeah. <laughs> Still staying in Epcot here, he did a lot of work there. Uh, before we had Wonders of Life, there was a Wonders of Health Pavilion. This is early in the drawing board uh, stages of Epcot. Um, and uh, so we asked him a little bit about that because he was the lead designer and he told us a little bit about the attractions that were going to be in there. When they decided to do Epcot, they started bringing in educated people. And uh, Charles Lewis, uh, out of uh, UCLA, uh, Dr. Charles Lewis, had a, we had a um, uh, convention at Disney World on, on life health. And so they brought in all the health educators from everywhere to be in that convention, and we'd sit and listen to them. They'd get up and they'd do a talk about what their belief was about health. And Dr. Lewis said the greatest thing, and it's the greatest line I'll ever remember, he said, if it's a ton of fun and an ounce of information, you reach the teachable moment. And I thought, holy shit, he knows what he's talking about. And you know, that was where Disney really fit in, because we knew how to reach the teachable moment with no problem at all. So I had nothing but respect for him. And I know I worked closely with him on the Land Pavilion for quite a few months 
and we weren't getting anywhere. And uh, I thought, wait a minute, something's wrong here. We're, so, because the, the, the health people were still fighting with each other and we were trying to listen to what they were saying and everything. So finally, I, I went to him one day and I said, wasn't there a common denominator as far as in the uh, life health world that everyone will agree on? Because they were fighting all the time. And he said, oh yeah, there's the eight health habits. And I said, what are the eight health habits? And he told me that, Jesus Christ, why didn't you tell me this months ago? <laughs> And so that changed the whole direction of doing the, land, of the Life and Health Pavilion was the eight health habits. They took over. And I did a, a design, the, the, the carousel with all the different little toys represented a health habit. We had little private uh, film shows about each habit. One was about the theater of the mouth, you know, and took it from there. And um, so we just, we had a great time. And then I had the best team in the world. Scott and Steve were absolutely incredible. So it just turned them loose on that, and away we went. And so I felt really sad that we never got the financing to do the original Life Health. We, I met with Pfizer. I met the president of Pfizer. I, you know, this is when we had all the models and uh, sketches at, at the World's Fair. I mean, at uh, New York, and they rented space there. And so, for us to try to sell this to all the big companies, we had these these rooms all set up. And I know it was really funny, they'd, they'd stick me on an airplane that on Sunday night, I'd fly to New York, I'd spend the night in, in um, of all places, <laughs> one of the best ho of hotels in the world, and uh, mass, no, no, uh, anyway, anyway, and the next morning I'd get up and I'd give the presentation, and I gave it to the president of Pfizer one time, and he fell madly in love with it. And he says, you know, Roly, he says, the only problem is we can't, our money is all in Europe, and we can't get the money out of Europe. And so, because you know, Disney wanted that the fine, this, to share the finances of the pavilion. I think it was fifty thousand each. And so we come to a total of a hundred thousand. And he was the sweetest man, God, and he loved everything that we were doing. But he didn't have the money, so they kind of put it back on the shelf. And it, it would have been great because we had a ride through the human body that was going to be done by uh, Frank Armitage. Frank Armitage was a wonderful illustrator, and he loved illustrating the, the human body. And so I had him come in and join us to do that. So we had a real, a real powerful team. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> the way it went. Yeah. yeah, it was really sad because we actually had, a, it was a thrill ride. It was a regular thrill ride. You went through and then at one point you get up here and then there would be a, a, um, a thunderstorm. And th you go into the thunderstorm and down you'd go. So it, was, it could have been absolutely great, but uh, no, it, things happen. Well, that wasn't the end of really working on uh, a health pavilion because a number of years later, he got a call from an old friend. Do you remember who it was? Oh, well, I think he'll say who it is. Oh, yeah. I forgot. I made these videos months ago. So, <laughs> uh, To help out with the new Wonders of Life pavilion. Um, that was Marty Scalar. He, uh, he called me and said, you know, really, I, we want to put a, 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 a mobile in Wonders of Life. He said, because it's just a big empty space up there. So I said, okay. So I actually uh, did it on a scratch pad and gave it to him. And Marty says, okay, fine. So he went to somebody to build it. And he gave it to him and said, build this. And the guy says, what's that? And he says, well, it's, in a, you know, it's a mobile. And they said, what's a mobile? And so the guy, and he said, well, do I get a working drawing? And she said, no, that's it. <laughs> so, you know, they, all these guys that do stuff figure they have to have a drawing or a working drawing. And he said, no, no. He says, you build that mobile right off that sketch. And I said, I feel good about that. <laughs> My son hung that mobile. Really? Oh. Yeah, because he, he was working with me at the time. And he says, I don't trust anybody else, so I'll do it. So they sent him up on a lift, and he hung it. Because he's been part of working with all of this, you know, as time goes on. In fact, the interesting story about it was <clears throat> when we were finishing the Tower of the Four Winds at downtown L.A. where they were building it, I took my family down there on a weekend to see what, what I was doing and everything. And so I've got pictures of my son standing there with all the pieces from the Tower of the Four Winds. And he's never forgotten that. Well, when I had my show, he built me a scale model of the, of the Tower of the Four Winds that actually worked for my show. So I thought that was incredible. 
His son is uh, Chris Crump, who uh, worked on Tokyo Disney Sea and a lot of other things too. So I believe he is select with Imagineering. It's uh, really cute. Yeah. As we wound down our interview with uh, Roly, one of the things that we did was ask him about his associations with certain people over the years, as we did earlier with with Tom and Bob up here. Uh, and of course, we asked about Dick Nunes. So we have our Dick Nunes. This is uh, my story favorites. From I love this. Oh yeah. Thing. He, he and I worked close together because I worked at Disneyland as uh, supervising art director for like three or four years and, and worked real closely with Dick and did everything. And he, one day he was showing me uh, how he ran the park. He took a box of popcorn and dumped it. He says, that'll be gone in five minutes. My guys will clean it up and I don't have to ask him. And sure enough, within five minutes, somebody was going to go over there and swept it up because he wanted the park immaculate. And so he, was, he trained people to do that. <clears throat> when I went to Circus World, I ran into Dick once, you know. I told Dick, I said, you know, we're doing Circus World. And I said, it's going to give Disney some competition. I still love Disney. I wasn't putting Disney down. I was just telling him that what we're doing is a, a great theme park. Well, Nunes took it as I was putting Disney down, and I was saying Circus World was better. That wasn't the case. It was just the idea that I wanted him to know that I was using everything that I learned from him and everybody else. I'm doing that for Circus World. <clears throat> so every time I'd see him, and I, every time I'd see him now, how are you doing, Dick? He says, you know, you still think that you're better. You know? And I said, oh, come on, Dick, get all of that. I said, no, not at all. But he was so diff, uh, dis, uh, to work with in Florida that <laughs> there was a big sign put up that once they were tired of Disney World. Once Disney World opens up, the, the newness will wear off. <laughs> and so, you know, and I thought, Jesus Christ, that's great. <laughs> I mean, what a way to get back at him. Well, I think what he did was brilliant. I love the way he ran the park, and I think it should have carried on even more so. Yeah. But, but he was good. It couldn't be any better. I learned a lot from, from him, and... Uh, and then the admiration that he had for Walt and fought for that, so that was good. No, I got nothing but give him a big 10. <laughs> well, we weren't disappointed in his Dick Nunes answer. <laughs> uh, and he, he got us with one other one. We asked the same question we asked of Bob and Tom. Uh, we asked him about Roy Disney, because you hear a lot of stories about this one and Walt, and, and you don't hear so many about Roy. So now when we get an opportunity to, to ask people who, who knew him or might have worked with him, uh, we asked the question, and we got a great story on that one, too. The only time I dealt with Roy was when we finished uh, the new Tomorrowland, and we were all having lunch up at the penthouse. And I'd never met Roy the whole time. I'd never even barely seen him. And Roy walked over to me. He says, are you Roly Crump? And he says, I just want you to know my brother used to talk about you. And I thought, <laughs> And he turned around and walked away. I thought, holy shit. <laughs> you know, what, what, you know you, what better credit can you have than to have a brother say, my brother talked about you? Well, speaking of his brother, we did ask him about Walt as well. And uh, I, when I made this clip, I made sure to take different comments throughout the entire interview. Uh, Rolly was speaking about Walt in many different ways, and I tried to sum it up as best I could. In fact, when I had my exhibit in the library, my art in the library, um, I had mobiles, I had my uh, propellers and everything, but I had all my dope posters in a hallway. And, I, and, and then the, the librarian called and said, Walt was here here today and saw your exhibit. I said, oh my God, did he go down the hallway? And she says, yes. I said, did he see my posters? And she says, yes, he did. She says, in fact, he laughed. <laughs> and you know what? I'm sure he did. I, you know, he had a great sense of humor. I think he, what he saw and what I did was it was a tongue in cheek. It wasn't anything serious, uh, whether it was a marijuana or whatever. I was just poking fun at things. And he accepted me doing that. Didn't take it, didn't read it any other way. So it was, uh, was kind of neat. Walt always had two uh, story men work together, and he'd always make sure that they didn't get along. Because he knew that if these two guys didn't get along, the best product would come out. That was the old man. That's what he did. 
He was brilliant, just absolutely brilliant. And he would do it and he got a big smile on his face. <laughs> you know, he, he really uh, accepted everybody for who they were. And, and he also realized that he had a company that did nothing but tease people, play games with me. I mean, it was a playful place to work. And he knew that. So he never, never held anything against, against that at all. And some of the crazy stuff that took place there was unreal. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah incredible man. Jesus. It was in the morning. I was at my office, and John Hench came out and told me. And that's just when everything just went whew. I mean, when he passed away, you could feel it throughout the company. And I went, went out and had some drinks, and I ended up crying, and I damn near cried all night long uh, about that. That was a very emotional time frame. Because it was pretty much a secret, you know, they kept it real quiet about what he was, why he went to the hospital and everything. So it was, it was hard. It was hard on all of us. In fact, I remember um, when that day happened, we all went over to a, one of the restaurants that we all went to, and we had cocktails and we drank to Walt, and then we kept on drinking and drinking, <laughs> and, you know, yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of sad. And then I ended up crying most of the night. It was, it was just tragic. I mean, it's hard to believe that Walt Disney's going to die. No, not at all. Well, we certainly thank Rolly for that story as well as the other ones. Certainly touching there. And, and for those of you that saw the video, um, you could certainly see it in his face and his emotions that uh, he missed Walt. I mean, we want to thank uh, Rolly and Marie for not only inviting us and allowing us to, us to come into their homes to do this interview, but also a special thank you to Rolly for... Uh, appearing live to Retro Magic, uh, as we mentioned, you know, he got a standing ovation and everybody was really happy to see him. So it was awesome. All right. So as we mentioned in earlier in the episode too, we have a limited supply of some of the Retro Magic gifts. Um, we always make a little extra just because we don't know who's going to show up and what our total numbers are going to be at the event. So we do certainly have a, a limited supply of these. Um, for those that haven't seen it or haven't heard about it, we made three holiday ornaments. One is the Retro Magic logo, which is takes its design cues directly from one of the Spectro Magic floats. So you can certainly see the inspiration there that Hal had. Um, second one, which turned out to be the real big one because we didn't know that Tom Morris had something to do with this, which was the, we made a ornament of the journey into imagination ride vehicle. And, um, that, which is really cool. So people went over and had him sign it at the event, which was pretty cool. And he, I, I don't know if you guys know this at the end, he came over to me, he goes, is there any way I can get like seven or eight of these? I want to make a working turntable model of the Imagination Pavilion. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's cool. <laughs> so he was really excited about that. Um, and the third one is the, the third ornament is a, um, is a replica of the mouse, which was the airplane that Walt flew over um, Florida when spotting the property. And uh, Bob Gurr has, has been on that plane before, so that was kind of a connection to everybody there. So so is Sarno. Uh, I told people to have Sarno sign theirs because he wrote it as well. Oh, he wrote. That's right. That's right. He did fly it. So, yeah. uh, so we tried to take a um, uh, an inspiration from a lot of different areas. And it's really tough to encompass something so large when you've got you know eleven VIPs. Um, you know, topics abound. How do you bring it down to a gift that kind of represents that? So that's why it was kind of a, a set, if you will, of three different um, inspired pieces from. From, from different areas. It was a good set, too. I f finally held them, and they were, like, real heavy, solid, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, they, like, a good weight to them. Like, you could use the Journey into Imagination float as a paperweight on oh, your yeah. desk. Yeah. You could, yeah, you could set it on the desk. The um, the plane, I, I love that we got the little circular clear discs to simulate the prop spinning. Yeah. So, like, it's flying through the air, which is really cool. So, um, so yeah. So, we have extras. If you go to retromagic.org... Uh, on your web browser or your smartphone that will bring you to a donation page and um, you can select the $50 donation level and we will send you the set of all three ornaments to your front door so it is holiday time um, you know all these holidays are coming up it's a great gift for any uh, retro lover any Disney lover so certainly grab one or two of those for your friends and family um, with that, other ways that we are raising money is also with T-shirts uh, on our T Public site, which have been going very well. But um, we haven't had an episode in a while. But I know 
How you're going to have something up there inspired by one of our previous episodes, I understand. Yes, yes. So one of the things that that we're talking about doing for a while and haven't done yet is, uh, of course, uh, at an advertising agency. So we're going to do, to set the record straight for everybody, and if you can dream it, you can do it, t-shirts and buttons and all that paraphernalia. So you can, you know, shove that in people's face and go, she's the one who did it. That's the Sherilyn's. Awesome. So we'll get that up to our T public site and you can find that by going to retro WDW.com forward slash support us. One last item here is that you certainly have to be on the lookout for, cause we're going to get these going soon. Um, we have some updated numbers. We talked about this at retro magic as well. Um, but we have, uh, no less than 60 to 70 films and videos ready to post on top of that. Um, how's eight millimeter collection has been now digitized. And I've got about, I've got a list in front of me here, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of another 25 to 30 different cuts from all of his tapes that I'm going to put together. In fact, I was working on one today. Um, I, it, it was well, his home movies from 72, some mission to Mars stuff. And then I'm on to Disney MGM in 93 that I'm currently putting together. Um, and we've got, man, I'm looking at this, not only, American Journeys, Kitchen Cabaret, Communicore, 20K, The Final Years. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff in here, How You you, you certainly used the, your I, camcorder very well. He knew he was well. going to be part of a podcast Apparently. and a website in yeah. <laughs> the future, so he was like, I got to get this stuff now. I interviewed <laughs> Skippers and so. just had him like, come out and like just say some stuff to the camera. Like, I don't even know if it came out. I, I Like, I had a little lavalier mic for him. I, I hope it is. Uh, Todd, you probably... I've never ha- awesome. had a chance to watch it. I don't know if I don't know if it's good or bad or indifferent. So you you, you handed these tapes over to me, and you have no idea. <laughs> it's like he every was, home he, movie any he dad was, has ever taken, though. We, he, was wear, he was wearing a little suit and had a headset on that wasn't plugged into anything. He's like, hi, I'm WHOW News here. I'd like to interview you. <laughs> we did that for a while, and then finally somebody came out in the suit and was like, you can't do that. Stop it. So... So we oh, stopped man. doing Sorry. it because I think they were sitting like we. Would, I would talk to somebody and I would say like, "Go get somebody else." So they would go bump. They would go pull somebody from other some other place out of rotation <laughs> and come out and talk to me. It was the funniest thing. So hopefully, hopefully the audio came out. I don't know, but yeah, I mean, I spent Jesus like two years just going around and filming as many different things as possible. Stuff that we knew was closing. Gosh, you were, you yeah. were so ahead of the curve. Like you were documenting before people did what they do now. Like, yeah. That's insane. To and me. with no medium to put it out later yeah, in mind, you just, you there just... was, we didn't have YouTube or anything. We just like, all right, get the stuff while the getting's good. Cause someday someone will want to see it. And sure enough, that someday finally, finally it's happened. Here. Yep. And I think we should let the, the fan base know they probably have heard hints of it, but we are, almost ready here we we played it at retro magic which was a you you were had the wherewithal back in 1989 to not only videotape the entire horizons ride but to use a wide angle lens on it to get essentially the human eye perspective on the entire ride maybe even a little more um which most people just would use the wide angle on their camcorder which just isn't wide enough and you went the next step. And I think from Jules Verne to the end of the ride, we have it in your wide, widescreen. We're well, not widescreen, but wide angle lens. Yeah. Well, uh, you could, which I is, mean, that was one of my things when I would, I would videotape stuff and watch it back. It's like, you, you know, Jeff Blythe, I said, I think said it really well when he's talking about circle yes. vision, how he called it like a lighthouse view. Yes. Where it was just this very sort of, you know. A, a, a small aperture that you could sort of see this through a small window. I think, I think he and, said it was only like 30 degrees is what he would say, which is incredible. Small. So a home camcorder was not wildly different from that. I mean, and these sets in a ride like Horizons were massive. So you, you'd you only see, you know, like a little slice of, of the set at any given time. So I was like, well, they, they just like they do today with your iPhones and stuff. It's like they had little extra lenses that you could clip on the front of your camcorder lens in order to get a wide angle view so i'm like let me shoot some stuff in wide angle and let's try to capture as much of the feeling of of this ride as possible and uh, as we got into the 90s it's like we knew that some things you know there we knew that some rides were goner so we tried to get as much stuff as possible uh of those rides before they were gone and and that was it it was 
with all the audio recordings I've done, which are going to be on, on the retro WW, uh, WDW site soon. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that, um, Brian's got to convert for me for audio. It's like with the video and the photographs, Todd, I'm going to be sending you all my photos to digitize now. Yep. Um, I mean, we, <laughs> I don't have a 401k from as, <laughs> as young an age as I, as I should have, because I spent hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands of dollars, like on film and videotape and processing and, uh, like spent just every free weekend I could in the park taking pictures of stuff. So uh, finally, you guys are going to get to see this all. And, and I think you're going to see a lot of stuff that you never got to see before. And I'm really excited to finally share that with everyone. And we should let people know that the first box has been fully scanned. It's on en route back to you, How actually, all the original photos. All right. Um, and uh, we've uploaded to the site, and now it's a matter of tagging it. But we've got – you took stereoscopic photos. I oh, mean, yeah. who took of her, not only Horizons but of the park? Who, if everybody remembers Magic Eye in the '90s, you know, where you would cross your eyes to see a hidden image, you can do this on Hal's photos, and you can see Horizons and and the Penny Arcade and the Met and and the castle in 3D, and it's just dumbfoundingly cool. Huh? I I was fascinated. I'm nerdy when it comes to some things, and I was fascinated by binaural sound and. 3D stereoscopic photography and all that stuff because I'm just I just I'm attracted to things that are cool and different and unusual. So, yep, I <laughs> you know we should charged. we should make your own your own very your own ViewMaster discs. We could make stereoscopic ViewMaster the, the How Bowers edition. We could, but we can also set this stuff up now. Uh, virtual to goggle, go, yeah, to, yeah, to go in cardboard and all kinds of virtual reality things. So I mean, I I didn't know that this would exist someday in the future but like the future is now so it's we're finally ready to put this stuff out well send the next box how the machine is ready to uh scan your next your next set all right and uh for all those listening watch out for the horizons video which will release relatively soon i um, just have a couple things to put on the start and end of that and watermark it we'll get it out there for everybody to see um and with that you'll have at least we, we, we're, we're planning it, but I'm thinking it's going to be at least a video every week uh, for the next year and a half plus, possibly even straight yeah, two years. For sure. Two years. And we still have, I got a pile of eight millimeter films that have been piling up for the past four or five months that have to be sent off for for, uh, for digital uh, transfer. And as if you're following our Twitter feed, we got another Jungle Cruise frog. They're coming out of <laughs> everywhere now. It's That's probably the crazy. best shot yet probably do well so subscribe to us on youtube retro ww and also uh on vimeo what do i even call it on vimeo favorite our channel yeah on vimeo. it's retro wdw um, on vimeo as well so yeah find them both and then you'll be up to date um there's a bell there if you click on that bell you'll be alerted when we upload something too so you'll be the first to see yep. it sounds good well with that everybody we will be back next month on a normally regular scheduled program uh, um, we haven't decided the topic yet but we will dive into some area history um and i think also too you know we did horizons in in 2019 um now we have morris uh, we've got some stories from him i think guys we should probably uh commit to taking uh, a little ride into imagination sometime in 2020 as well would be a smart thing to do oh that's for a biggie sure, yeah. yep that's a biggie so you can Sit down and buckle up and wait for that one. So we will be back in December with an all uh, new episode for you. And uh, with that, thank you very much for listening. Give us a shout out on iTunes and a review if you can. And uh, we'll see you next month. With that, Brian, take us out. Follow the Lake Buena Vista Historical Society on Twitter and Instagram at LBV History and on the web at lbvhistory.org. Follow Todd McCartney and Retro WDW on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Retro WDW. For all things Retro Disney World, including exclusive merchandise, visit us on the web at RetroWDW.com. On Twitter, follow our web designer, Jason Bartell of Deepwater Studios, at JasonDWS. Our announcer, Andre Gardner, at Andre Gardner. And follow our hosts, Hal Bowers, on Twitter and Instagram, at GoAwayGreen, and on the web at KingdomOfMemories.com. For JT Couser on Twitter, at LS1JT, on YouTube at Rubber City Motoring, and on the web at RubberCityMotoring.com. And you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at Brian P. Miles. 
Retro Disney World is the monthly podcast of the Lake Buena Vista Historical Society, a nonprofit, nonpartisan, tax exempt 501c3 organization, and is not affiliated in any way with the Walt Disney Corporation or any of its subsidiary or affiliated entities. Because the age of information is sweeping across the nation.